Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. what we have just heard. When was the arm of Yahweh revealed in you? You grew up like a sapling before us, like a root in parched soil. You had no stately form or majesty to make us look at you. There was no beauty to attract us. You were rejected and despised by all. You know suffering intimately and you are acquainted with sickness. When we saw you, we turned our faces away. We despised you and did not value you. Yet you bore our illnesses and carried our suffering. We thought you were being punished, struck down by God and brought low. But it was for our offenses that you were pierced, for our sins that you were crushed. Upon you lies a chastening that brings us wholeness, and through your wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us goes our own way. But Yahweh has laid upon you the guilt of us all. Though treated harshly, you bore it humbly and never opened your mouth. Like a lamb being led to a slaughter, or a sheep before shearers, you were silent and never opened your mouth. Seized by force and condemned, you were taken away. Who would ever have foreseen your destiny? You were taken from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. You were buried with evildoers and entombed with the rich, though you had done no wrong and deceit was not found in your mouth. 
but Yahweh chose to crush and afflict you. If you make yourself a reparation offering, you will see your descendants, you will prolong your days, and the will of Yahweh will prevail through you.
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away, so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? I cry all day, my God, but you never answer. I call all night long and sleep deserts me. But you, Holy One, you sit enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you they trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and were saved. They trusted you and were never disappointed. Yet here I am, more worm than human, the scorn of humanity, an object of ridicule. All who see me mock me. They shake their heads and sneer. You trust in God? Ha! Let God save you now. If God is your friend, let God rescue you. Yet you drew me out of the womb. You nestled me in my mother's bosom. You cradled me in your lap from my birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Don't stand aside now that trouble is near. I have no one to help me. My enemies are like a herd of bulls surrounding me, like the strong bulls of Bashan closing in on me with jaws open wide to swallow me. They are like lions tearing their prey and roaring. I am like water draining away. My bones are all disjointed. My heart is like wax melting inside me. My strength is dried up like a piece of clay pottery and my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth. You lay me down in dusty death. A pack of dogs surrounds me. A gang of brigands closes me in. They pierce my hands and feet. I can count every one of my bones. And there they stare at me gloating. They divide my garments among them and cost lots for my clothes. But you, Yahweh, don't be far off. My strength, hurry to help me. Rescue my life from the sword my dear life from the power of these dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth, my poor soul from the wild bull's horns. Then I will proclaim your name to my sisters and brothers and praise you in the full assembly. Matthew 27 Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple 
and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I read this week in a commentary on uh, one of the Gospels about the question of the darkness that came over the world when Jesus was crucified. The following words that I'd like to use as an introduction. Perhaps the Lord cast dark clouds and deep gloom across the face of the earth to say meteorologically, naturally, physically, and in sign language, this is it. As at the beginning, Jesus was singled out in baptism with open heavens, the descending dove and the divine voice. So now at the end, he's singled out again, but this time cosmically over the whole earth as if to say to the whole world, the most portentous thing ever to happen is happening now. At the very time of the day when the sun is supposed to be at its zenith, everything slipped. I read years ago in a sermon, uh, a story that has st stuck with me by Debbie Thomas. She said some years ago when my daughter was in middle school, she became anorexic. During the worst of her illness, she had to be hospitalized for both her physical and mental health. On the morning of her admission, after the doctors explained that I would not be able to see my depressed, malnourished child for several days, I walked out of the hospital, got into my car, and started driving without aim or purpose. I ended up in the parking lot of a Catholic gift shop I'd never seen before. Shaking, I walked in and wandered the aisles until a woman with a kind face approached me. Can I help you find anything? she asked. I burst into tears and said nothing. She gave me a hug and said, wait here. After disappearing for a minute, she returned with a small velvet box. Inside it was a tiny silver crucifix on a chain. Pressing the necklace into my hand, she said, hold this, keep it with you. Only a suffering God can help. Only a suffering God can help. We live in times that are not really ordinary. We live in the wake of COVID and the world is as confused and chaotic and violent and ugly as we have ever seen it. And life is hellishly difficult. Many people have lost their jobs. Many people have lost savings. Some are numb, disassociated, unable to process the scope of what's happening around the world. Some are depressed, anxious, lonely. Some are terrified. Some are grieving the dead. Our family and loved ones are suffering and some have died. What is there to say in times like this? What does our faith offer us? Well, it offers us a core truth a healing truth, a paradoxical and shocking truth that only a suffering God 
can help. And a suffering God, a crucified, broken, desolate God is what we have. I know that there's so much to be asked, pondered and debated about when we discuss the theological meanings of the cross. What precisely happened when Jesus died? Why did, what did his crucifixion accomplish? What can we know for sure about sin and sacrifice and death? Or even atonement and eternity in the light of Christ's death? These are all essential questions. And many minds have considered these uh, for centuries. But at the moment, what is important to me, what strikes me most, is not so much the theology, but the story itself, bare and unadorned. The story of betrayal, denial and abandonment story of cruel, unjust trials, false accusations, and the mysterious silence of Jesus. The story of torture, floggings, the story of thorns, the story of bloody wounds and oxygen deprived lungs. The story of what happens when the God we want and think we know doesn't show up and another God a less efficient less aggressive far less muscular God shows up instead so often I think I know exactly what kind of savior I need savior of a swift repair or a majestic intervention the tangible presence with a very soft landing. But here's the thing, that Saviour is not Jesus. I was very aware of that when I was reading over the readings for Palm Sunday and I see Jesus choosing a little donkey to ride on into Jerusalem when he was aware that the crowds were gathering. Jesus is a different kind of Saviour. For those of us who've grown up in church, it might very well be the case that the horrors of the death of Jesus, in fact, even the crucifixion, has faded into, faded into over-familiarity. We're used to worshipping uh, in front of a cross. We, we're doing it now. I do it with the crucifix behind me that I was given. We've seen so many pictures of Jesus icons of Jesus crucified that we barely notice. But what would happen if we could shake ourselves out of this familiarity for a few moments and see the story with fresh eyes? What if we could look at the cross and see what the followers of Jesus saw? Scandal, humiliation, godlessness, shame, the cross, as someone once said, as an electric chair. The cross as a lethal injection. The cross as a lynching tree. The Jesus we find in Matthew's Gospel is not a Jesus who presides victoriously over his final chapter. He is a man, a human, who suffers in utter vulnerability. He's naked. He's isolated. And when he prays in Gethsemane, he throws himself on the ground and pleads for his life. His torture at the hands of Pilate's soldiers weakens him so much that he can't bear the weight of his own cross. His flagellation by those Roman soldiers brought him almost to death. He cannot carry the cross on his own and Simon of Cyrene carries it for him. And his last word before dying is hardly a word at all. It is a howl, a wrenching cry of defeat and abandonment. My God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me? This is the only time in his gospel that Matthew gives us Jesus' Aramaic speech. It's the only time we hear the words in Aramaic. It's as if to say, what Jesus says now is so sacred that I want to give you his very words. And the sentence is for me the gospel at its deepest. It reveals better than any other sentence in the gospel who Jesus is and what he does. Every word in the sentence, even its punctuation, is gospel and deserves our meditation. So let us think about that for a moment. Let us begin with a concluding question mark. Because he says, why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' last sentence before his death was a question, not an affirmation. Jesus could have ended his life much more triumphantly with a noble exclamation, God is love, or love one another, or I triumph. But when he died asking questions, we learn that Jesus not only took on our flesh and blood, but also our nervous systems. He came not only giving us answers, he also came asking our questions. And questions seem weaker than exclamations. Jesus has been redefining strength his whole life. It's true that if you go back to the early church fathers who wrote about the Gospels, the first theologians, they were offended, some of them, by the idea that Jesus thought God abandoned him. So much so that they preferred to understand the words of Jesus metaphorically. They said he speaks not only not of his own need, but in the name of sinful humanity, as though in his person God had abandoned sinners. Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Abandon. Now verbs carry sentences. And this is the verb of our sentence. Did he really mean it? Is it really meant? Well, this verb and the whole sentence of Jesus are exactly the opening verse of Psalm 22. And people who didn't like the fact that Jesus said he was abandoned made the point that the psalm gets better. It begins as a question and then ends as trust. And so they conclude that Jesus is not as low as the first verse sounds. They say his citing of scripture is an act of faith. So they don't even like calling this statement, what we've called for it for many years, the cry of dereliction. They say it's really a cry of trust. Not despair, but a cry of maybe distress. That's right in a way. Uh, it's still fair to show that Psalm 22 does end in faith. But the point here is Jesus did not cry one of the more positive verses from Psalm 22. He concluded his life with the words, the first words, the literal, sad, plain meaning reading of the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus had wanted to be positive, he maybe could have cited the first verse of the next psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why didn't he? What if he didn't feel that way and doesn't want to lie? I prefer to believe that Jesus selected Psalm 22 because that's exactly how he felt and thought. He was praying to God. My God, my God, why did you abandon me? Now, Dante wrote uh, a book called The Inferno where he describes a descent into hell 
the different layers of hell. Of course, this is all his imagination. Many, most of the ideas of hell that people have got are not from the Bible. They're actually from Dante, Dante's poem. And in Dante's poem, the lowest level of hell is for people who have betrayed or abandoned. We know abandonment, people who have been divorced, deserted, rejected. And Jesus knew this hell. When it says he descended into Hades, in some ways it, it means that he descended into the darkness, into the darkness that all of us experience in life. I do not like to soften either this verse or its verb. Together they encourage us to believe that Jesus drained the dregs of our cup and experienced hell for us. He came all the way into our human experience. Jesus believed that God loved him. He still believes it. But that is why he has to ask the questions. Why did you abandon me then? At the very simplest level, the church has believed in Jesus as God's forsakenness, simply because he said so himself. I was thinking about this carefully. If God allowed Jesus, as on a psychological level, so I was thinking about it in that way, if God allowed Jesus to feel abandoned, isn't that a form of abandonment? There's no doubt a difference between real abandonment and felt abandonment. But to the one who's suffering at the moment, uh, they suffering um, that mental nicety doesn't give much help because they're feeling that loss. Why can't we allow Jesus to say abandoned when he feels, thinks, sees, and believes himself abandoned? It's okay to acknowledge that. And it's important for our salvation because now the loneliness of Jesus is now complete. He's been pretty much without any human support since his trials, since even Gethsemane in a way. But he had always had the wonderful gift of the Father's presence and the knowledge that he was in the will of God. At Gethsemane, his comforting knowledge of the perfect will of God was temporarily shaken or questioned. But he still had the Father. Father, if it is possible, please. But now on the cross, about to experience death, he doesn't even have that or feel that he has the presence of the Father anymore. Is it significant then at, that at the end he calls out to God rather than to the Father? I don't think so. Psalm 22 has God. It is not just knowledge of the will of God that he wonders about now as at Gethsemane. It's about God himself. This is the deepest darkness of all. When we feel God's presence go, the lights go out. And Jesus is not only surrounded by outward darkness. He doesn't inwardly feel God's presence at all. And if the light that is supposed to be in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I prefer to believe the question itself is to be taken literally. The lifeline of Jesus has been cut. He dies here before he dies. This is his descent into hell. And we should simply stand back in silence before this awful verb and wonder what it means. Death itself, as in fact the ultimate abandonment, the pain of death, the great tragedy for each and every one of us, consists precisely in the sense of abandonment. You are deserted by all and find yourself alone, face to face with God, your judge. And here Jesus, who represents all humanity, 
feels himself deserted by God and he allows himself to experience this annihilation, this total suffering. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, none of the 12 disciples of Jesus, or, or any of his male disciples for that matter, is recorded as present in Matthew's account. None of his family, mother, father, brothers or sister, is in Matthew's list of royals. So when Jesus says incredulously, you, why have you abandoned me? And then he says in so many words, I can understand, Father, why my family isn't here. They're human. I can even understand why my disciples aren't here. They're human too, though I wish they were here. But Father, I cannot understand. And I have to tell you, I cannot understand why, why you aren't here. I've been expecting you to stay. There is, in some sense, a deep disappointment in this you. Almost despair certainly discouragement the only thing that keeps it from despair is that at the same time jesus is saying why have you forsaken me he is calling out my god my god this was his greatest conflict harder than any other agony that in his anguish he was not given relief by his father's uh, favor but made to feel somehow estranged you will notice that the God who is not felt to be there, you abandoned me, is addressed as you. There's something wonderful in that. He's embracing the shamed and suffering God in himself. Now how do we accept this suffering God. Well, embracing Him and following Him are not easy. On the cross, Jesus bears the violence, the contempt, the pain and the humiliation of the entire world and He absorbs it into His body and He declares solidarity for all time with those who feel these feelings those who are abandoned, those who are colonized, those who are oppressed, those who are accused, those who are imprisoned, those who are beaten, those who are mocked, those who are murdered. And he, like he promised in that parable of the seed, he bursts open like a seed so that new life can grow and replenish the earth. And he takes as an instrument of torture, an instrument of torture, and he turns it into a bizarre vehicle of hospitality and communion for all people everywhere. Jesus was and is many things. Teacher, healer, companion, and Lord. And it is essential that we experience him in all of these ways. But at the center, the heart of who he is, is revealed at the cross. Only a suffering God can help. Only a suffering God can help us bear our own burdens. Only a suffering God can show us the way and lead us home. Only a suffering God can teach us how to love. And as Christians, we must never forget that we love because the cross draws us towards love. Its power is as compelling as it is mysterious. The cross pulls us towards God and towards each other. It's a vast and it's a complicated gathering place. Whether or not we want to see Jesus shamed and wounded, here he is, drawing us closer and closer to the darkness where light lives and dwells. This is the solid ground we stand on. It's stark, yes, and it's holy, it's brutal, 
but it's also beautiful. And to take up the cross, as Jesus does, is to stand always in the center of the world's pain. Not to just glance in the general direction of suffering and then sidle away, but to dwell there, to identify ourselves wholly with those who are aching and weeping and screaming and dying. Taking up the cross means recognizing Christ crucified in every suffering person and body that surrounds us and pouring our energies as Christ did into alleviating that pain, no matter what it costs. And in the context of our present world, it means trusting that God is in the very midst of the loss and the terror. He's mourning with us and for us. It means accepting that we will die, if not now, then later, and trusting, like Jesus, that we will rise again. It means speaking to our troubled hearts, which so often prioritize protection, uh, self-protection over everything else that matters in this life. And it means stepping away from the vicious cycles of denial and fear that seek to cheat death but rob us of abundant life. That the abundant life that Jesus died to give us. When we come to Holy Week, and it's the week that leads up to Easter, we are tired, maybe we are uncertain, we are afraid. Who knows how many sorrows and disappointments and jagged endings we will face before resurrection happens. Sometimes I can't bear the thought of that, the thought of not only myself suffering like that, but others who I love. But Jesus can bear it. If anything in this gospel is true, then this must be true as well. Our suffering God will not leave us alone. That's the awesome truth of when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? We see in him the very presence of God. He is the presence of God in his own abandonment, in our abandonment. He came, the word became flesh and lived among us and we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. Our suffering God will not leave us alone. There is no death we will die, small or big, literal or figurative, that Jesus will not hold in his crucified arms. So here we are, and here is our suffering, and our sorrowing, and our saving God. Here is the cross upon which we stand. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Let us pray. God, by your grace, may the cross and its reality come upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.
Christ suffered T'was all for sinners' gain Mine, mine was the transgression But thine the deadly pain Lo, here I fall, my sin sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs>